<laughs> I'm really pretty excited because uh, today I got in a fight with my wife. Oh yeah! <laughs> we got into a big old knockdown drag out, you know, who's going to be the boss routine, you know. Kind of like those shows, you know, who's the boss? Oh, you didn't know Christians have fights? Really? You mean you didn't read in the Bible, like with the disciples, about how they got along? Jewish guys, you know, one fisherman, kind of a drunk, you know. His brother, you know, kind of like a guy that was studying for, you know, the the ministry, you know, that went into, you know, was able to go places where the others couldn't go because he was actually accepted as a young man, the son of Zebedee, to uh, go into the holy place where obviously the fishermen couldn't go. And some of the others couldn't follow Jesus, but he was allowed to go into the council. Oh, they got along real well. One, a man of the people. One, a man of the cloth. And of course, we throw in a tax collector, and I'm sure that they just all got along, you know, hunky-dory, just right. That's why they were called Sons of Thunder? <laughs> no, I don't think so. So before we get into the good news, let's talk about the bad news. Wait a minute, there is no bad news. Oh! You see, bad news really isn't bad. People like to tell me things like, well, why do bad things happen to good people? And my first thought is, who's good? Because <laughs> I've never seen one yet. As soon as you find some good people, let me know. Because According to the Bible, I don't find too many good people running around. I see a good Father in Heaven, but other than that, I don't, I don't know too many people that are good. But then I question, what makes you think that's a bad thing? Because you see, if I'm going to count it all joy when I fall into diverse trials and tribulations, knowing that the working of my faith produces patience, for the patient has perfect work, that the man of God might be fully equipped, ready to do and to perform every function that God has intended him to do according to the word of God and according to studying the Proverbs and you know all the things that we go through in life. I don't see so much bad as I see good. I think if God is in control, that's good. If God allows something to happen into your life that seems like it's going to like wipe you up, that's bad. But because God said he provided a way to escape from it, he says, if, he says that you know, I'll also give you a way to escape that you be able to bear, that's good. But he said that it's also for your maturation that you have to be strived, you were healed, and that you by obedience you suffer the things that you suffer so that you'll learn obedience. That's bad. But you know that you also, you know, reap what you sow. That's good, I think. So you see, a lot of what we are doing is often confusing what we call perspective. You know, I mean, on the one hand, there's the right hand. On the left hand, there's the left hand. Somewhere, if we're in the camera, that's not my right and left, is it? Or from your perspective, it may be the opposite, because you're looking at it from the opposite point of view. Stage right may not be camera right, and stage left may not be camera left. Upstage may be downstage to you, but downstage may be upstage for me. Perspective. God wants us to always look at things from His perspective. Because, you see, man looks on the outward things, but God looks on the heart. My wife and I don't fight fair. She likes to fight. Fight. You know, she likes to, like, get mad. She gets furious. She gets angry. She vents whatever on her head in her mind. And, woo! you know, wow, where did all that come from? Who knows? Who cares? Does it really matter? And I like to fight. According to what am I going to get out of this? What can I learn from this experience? What is God showing me in this, you know, breakdown of communication? How can we make this applicable so that we could use this in our life for the profiting of the ministry and also for the growth thereof of each individual part so that together we might cooperatively come to a conclusion that we could lift up the name of Jesus and see in both parts 
our own responsibility, accountability, and our own looking at the way that the Holy Spirit is using us in order to train us up into something that we can become more than what this circumstance and situation seems to be apparently not about, but what it is really about, which is we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the prayer of the in high places. You know, looking at it from God's point of view. My wife don't want to see it that way. <laughs> she wants to be mad, stay mad, get mad, vent mad. It's like, mad, 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 world. You know, you remember that comedy? That's what really getting mad is all about. I don't know if you've ever seen that, it's a mad, bad, 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 bad world. But you know, it's kind of about this story about a bunch of people, you know, that find out, you know, Jonathan Winters is in it and all kinds of people you probably never heard about, but... A bunch of these people are all in this whole thing about they find out in New York City that there's this gold in the Mojave Desert. And so they all start running from the subway to get there as fast as they can, to be the first one to claim it. Not name it, claim it, but to, you know, go find it somehow. And so it's a mad dash, you know, there it's a, almost like a cross-country race. And they're all trying to get to California in order to get the gold, you know. And it's a mad, 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 mad world because they'll do anything to get there. They'll try everything. They do silly things. They do goofy things. The whole point of the movie is it's a comedy. It's even rated for families. Wow. But <laughs> even Dean Martin was in it. Frank Sinatra. But my point is this. It was so silly that it reminds me of what every fight I've ever seen is, even in counseling, when people come in with serious fights, you know, like fighting over whatever it may be. It's really pretty stupid. Romaine used to say it this way, there's only one reason to fight, and that's your pride. Your pride got hurt, so after that, you know, there's nothing else left. I didn't really agree with him at first, but later on, you know, I began to kind of see it from his point of view and kind of understand where he's coming from. And my wife, when she fights with me, I always see her point of view. Right off the bat, man, I've got her point of view down. You know, it's like, well, let me explain it to you. So you say this, you know, and you're seeing this, and you, this is what you feel, you know, and this is how you're experiencing it, and this is how you're relating it to, and this is how you want to, you know, resolve it, and this is what you're, you know, wanting to accomplish, and this is how you are dealing with it at this moment, and this is, and, you know, quite frankly, I can get literal, you know, and I've been, you know, I've been there, you know, I'm a sociologist, you know, well, not sociologist, but, you know, I'm, I'm Jewish, what can I say? You know, I've been around for a while. But anyway, my point is this. I understand it. You know, I've been into interpersonal communication skills. You know, we've done the group therapies. You know, it's like, hey, you know, we can work this out. You know, Bible studies and everything else. Cooperative communication skills, you know, and those things that are interactive, reactive type of environments with which we have to determine from the Spirit of God whether this is a spiritual problem, an emotional problem, a physical problem, a intellectual problem. A, you know. But really, God always speaks to me right off the bat. It's like, hey, we have and I'm always kind of humorous about it because I'm more like, hey, you know, I mean, from the moment I met my wife, I said, I choose to love you. I said, I don't love you the way you think. I love you the way God thinks. And God chose to love you. God loves you because his nature is such that he chooses to reveal his love to you. And so she never really understood that. And, you know, over the years, she gradually went, boy, you love me more than even I love me or I love you and all this stuff. And I said, yeah, pretty much. You know, when we got done with our fight, you know, that's what she was doing. She was kind of like sitting on the bed, you know, and she was talking to me, and I was going, well, first of all, I said, I laid down, I said, okay, honey, you sit on that corner of the bed. I said, we're not going anywhere. That's one of the biggest things that's the biggest fight about is what we do. We're not doing ministry. We're not doing, uh, we're not doing ministry. We're not doing conversations. We're not doing communications. We're not doing, you know, anything that we had planned stops till we resolve the issue, you know, because if this fight's going to go on, it won't look good. So, you know, she'd already thrown me out, got rid of me, you know, just divorced me and all these other things that people say when they don't mean it. You know, and I'm like, my feelers are hurt. Because I have developed on purpose that sensitivity to the responsiveness of where she's coming from. That yeah, I already know the answer. I already know what's going to happen. I already know it's going to go. You know, you just got to go through it, the motions, because that is what's going through that person's mind at that point in time. Emotion. So you have to go through the motion so you allow them the opportunity to incorporate God's devotion to us by causing that third part of our marriage, Jesus himself, who is the third part of our marriage. Marriages are not two people. Marriages are always three people involved. 
I'm sorry, but it's not a polygamy and it's not a plutarchy, but it's a triarchy. You know, and the triarchal marriage format is one of like a pyramid, you know, where you kind of get closer to God, you get closer to each other, kind of that kind of thing, you know. And your interpersonal relationships is kind of like the cross piece. You are the cross piece. You're never going to get it right. You got to go through Jesus to get it right. So if you're going up and down, you know, and you go up and down, you know, you're always looking up to look down. And guess what? You're getting it on great with your wife. Otherwise, you know what? You're just faking it till you make it. I know. Been there. So, I'm often fascinated because, you know, not everyone wants the same thing in a relationship. Some people just want to be taken care of. Some people just want to be provided for. Some people want God in the man. Or some people want um, goddesses in the women. You know, I mean, literally, because they want, oh, make them and shake them and break them, you know, or make them, you know, take them, whatever. But they want, you know, like gorgeous, or they want trophy wives, or they want slaves, or they want servants, or they want to be one up and or, you know, they're just dealing with it because they feel responsible because they had a baby, you know, or accountable because they want to be responsible or whatever. So there's lots of reasons why relationships come into existence. Just as much as there's lots of reasons why all relationships come into existence in some way. I relate to the earth, the air, the sky, the, the, the water, you know, to cold, heat, life, death, all differently. They're all relationships. They all have to be dealt with differently because they all interact differently. Same thing is true about our relationships and how you come into marriage. But once you enter into a covenant agreement with, quote, a holy God, it becomes holy matrimony. Holy smokes! Are you kidding me? Don't get married! Yeah, that's what Jesus said. Yeah, you might not be such a good deal, you know. You might want to consider that. It's kind of serious stuff. Little do they know. And not many teach what I teach about marriage. No, they wouldn't get married if they did, quite frankly. Or maybe they would, because they'd see the exaltation of the reality of the expression of joy that God has in the marriage of a man and a woman and God together as one, even as he prayed for the church to be one, as he prayed that his disciples would be one with him and he with the Father, and the Father would make him that way. That's marriage. Marriage is up in the land. Come on, guys. Where are you going? Connect the dots. You get it? So, in a lot of ways, what people don't realize is when they fight with their wife, they're fighting with the church. I mean, their wife is a perfect representation of the church, period. You are that representation of Jesus to the church. How do your how's your ministry going? Go look at some guy's wife. Is he ministering to her like a man of God, or you know, like Christ loved the church? Oh, give me a break! That's such a phony excuse. Christ loved the church in the sense of this: letters to seven churches. Hello, that's how Christ loved the church. So. When you're telling me about your bride, you know, and you lay down your life for your bride, come on now. Any man that's been married for longer than five minutes on the honeymoon knows full well, once the honeymoon's over, the honeymoon's over. And every woman I know to this day will tell you, the man is not the man I married. Sorry, it's true. Thank God we become maturated by the frustration or the maturation process with which we grow into relationships. We grow through frustration but grow into relationships. The interrelationship of two lives that are coming together that are forming the helix and the the, the helix and the what is it, the RNA and the DNA of what we are made up of inside. And the cross pieces are the chromosomes and the I forget what it was called. The ribonucleic acids that with which we are formulated together that we become life and if you want to have spiritual life you have to come together as one so that the connections within that coding that is codified within our soul and our being that the very atoms and cells are created in order to have life have tripartite to it God the last part and so with becoming a living soul there has to be God involved in your marriage so if he's not you know where you're at you got fleshy marriage you ain't no ass you may be able to fake it for a while but Anybody can see through it. We're just not telling you about it. We're hoping you're going to get it, you know, sooner or later. Get it? Got it? Good. Because in reality, marriage can be a civil union. A civil union is just civil union. Homosexuals can get married. Anybody can get married. I mean, to put it bluntly, marriage is just like what they say. Hey, you know what? 
two cows could get married. I mean, but a poly, because it's just a covenant. That's all it is. It's just an agreement. They agree to be together. That's all. Now, when we talk about the joining together of becoming one, like Jesus said, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and his father, and the two shall become one. If that's what you're talking about, because remember, God defines marriage. We don't. We define the parameters with which we operate in a given society. If the society says that, hey, civil unions are legal, they're legal in society. So what? That's not what I'm talking about. It's not even what God was talking about. Civil union is not you know, wrong. It's not right. It's just neutral. Same thing with what you're talking about with homosexuals or whatever kind of sexual relationships you're talking about. Hello? Those relationships are confused, abused, but you know what? That's not what God was talking about when he said that a man shall leave a woman and a mother shall leave his... a father shall leave whatever, leave one another, you know, male and female, and come together. He didn't say, oh, all marriage is male and female. No, he didn't. Not at all. He didn't say that you were making a contract. No. A contract is a contract. That's all. You can't make marriage out to be that covenant that God instituted. No, God instituted the relationship of a man and a woman. He didn't institute a relationship of a man and a man. We call that fellowship. We don't call that marriage. We don't call that the two becoming one flesh, do we? So you see, there's a really poor way of Christians fighting today about the wrong things at the wrong time, making it a mad, 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 mad world that everybody gets mad. The Christians are mad at the homosexuals. The heterosexuals are mad at the Christians. The society is mad because everybody's doing whatever they're doing. It's just a mad, 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 mad world. Because I don't know about what you know, but you know, when Jesus was hanging on that cross, he looked down and he saw, you know, some of the Romans over there that were homosexual, some of them. He saw some of the, you know, Jews that were like, you know, like messed up, you know, kind of didn't know God. He looked down and he saw, you know, like some of the pedophilias and homophilias, you know, and he saw the all oh, whatever kind of philias you got. He saw the entire world and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And in this mad, 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 mad world that we live in, even like my wife today, who was mad, 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 it was a mad, mad world for a while. And so we went at it, you know. I mean, we always go at it, you know. It's like, hey, you know what? We're going to get this solved one way or another. No, we're not. I'm, I want you out of my house. I'm tired of you. Blah, 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 blah. You know, you know. Fine. I'll go. Let's go. Watch what happens. You reap what you sow. You want me to go? I'll get out, you know. Come out from under the covering. Hey, watch this. And uh, thank God nobody records it, which I did once. You know, it's kind of humorous, but, you know. You don't want to really record yourself because guess what happens? You reveal yourself. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, my wife doesn't like that one either. <laughs> I'll bring it up. I'll remind her of Proverbs, you know, Psalms. I'll remind her of all kinds of scriptures that nobody wants to hear because it's true. Now, people say, oh, that's taken out of context. Not that one. No, your mouth shows what you are. Your words reveal who you are. That's why we are saved by grace, because we're sure not saved by our profession. We're not saved by our actions. We're not saved by anything we say we are, or we say we do, or we make some kind of like, holy profession, I went up and I got saved 17,000 times by going forward and saying, I want Jesus. That ain't going to save you. Grace is what saves you. You're just learning to give it over to the Father. Give it over to the Son. Give it over to the Spirit. Do, 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 until we become one. And the reality is that you're just learning some things you don't know about life. And you don't. Because even Jesus said that when he came to bring light into the subject, because most people thought they knew what they were doing, and God said, literally, through his Son, you don't understand it at all. You don't even have a clue what marriage is or what relationships are. And... You can't even make, you know, do with what you got. You make doo-doo, you know. I mean, you make doo-doo out of the law. You make doo-doo out of being the light to the world. You make doo-doo out of Gentiles. You make doo-doo out of the nation. Matter of fact, you make doo-doo out of who I am. You don't even know me. And here I am, standing before you, 
God. Ooh. And so we say today, marriage is between a man and a woman. Not mine! <laughs> uh -oh. Every time I hear that, I go, oh, uh -oh. no way, dude. Yours may be between a man and a woman. Not mine. Mine's spiritual. I'm sorry. The union that God has placed together is I've got a wife who's got Jesus inside. And there is a man here who's got Jesus inside. And when the two become one, I'm sorry, but they're Jesus, me, and my wife. Hello? Sorry. Your marriage is between a man and a woman. Mine is between a man, a woman, and God. So it's not quite what you think is society. I don't need a marriage license. Sorry. That's kind of a thing that, you know, somehow the church got deceived into getting involved in again. You know, it's like, what quality of necessity in societal norms makes a Christian marriage more marriageable because you've got that justice of the beast. Think about that. There's a reason why he's called that, but you don't even really want to go there because it has a lot to do with Jewish. That justice of the peace by the court appointed authority that he's been given by the people, for the people and other people, and hopefully God in some way, some form, some shape, of some kind of God, stamps and says, ah, you're married. So you get all these marriage bennies that go along with being married. Did you know that Jews don't pay much attention to civil law in Israel? As a matter of fact, Orthodox Jews don't have anything to do with the civil law. So, they assure him they don't recognize the state of Israel as even existing. They say it's an illegal nation. They marry and are given a marriage by rabbinical Orthodox they're not Hasis even. Um, it's probably they're not even Satmar. But they don't, yeah, it's really they're really, like, they're ultra, we, they're what we call the ultra-Orthodox. It's easier just to call them ultra-Orthodox because there's a bunch of different sects. Every every rabbi, to put it bluntly, and this is why Judaism, I, I love hearing about Pharisees and how they were sad, you see, and Pharisees are far, you see, or whatever they, I don't even know what they call Pharisees. You know, I hear that stupid joke and it's like, well, you don't know much about Pharisees. Paul was a Pharisee, so I'm sure that he was like, you know, whatever. And the Sadducees are sad, why? You think they're sad? I don't think they were so sad. And every rabbi, according to what sage he was attuning himself to, in seeking to know the Almighty One, would accommodate that teaching in his life. So according to the lifestyle choice with which he arranged his life and was affecting his kavanah, the attitude of his heart, he chose to live according to that particular Rabboni, or that particular rabbinical type of lifestyle choice that was made according to the sage that was leading that particular way of life. People try to nail it down and say, well, you know, there were two great schools of thought. Really? Sounds very dual dualism. The duality of Judaism? Do you know what dualism is? It's a Greco thought. It's Hellenism. It's something that has nothing to do with Judaism. If you look at Jewish culture, you already know that you put two Jews in a room and you got four opinions and six synagogues. Okay, maybe that's an exaggeration of the way we say it. But, you know, two Jews, three synagogues. You know, one for me, one for you, and one for the guy that's going to visit. You know, because, hey, we're not going to agree. And that's the way it was in Israel, Yisrael, or Klal Israel, at the time of Jesus. They weren't all cooperating together. Everybody was moving and grooving for power. There were at least 30 individual power plays of people associated together inside of Judaism that were operating within the Temple Mount that were trying to operate within the Temple that were trying to vie for power. That's why you would have to have in the the council a certain privileged group that would meet at certain times and only not tell everybody else because they tried to get away with something. And everybody was trying to get their own little piece of the pie. Just like we do today. Go tell me what's going on in Congress. There's no difference. That's what Judaism was like. That's what Christianity is like. I mean, in, when you get a Catholic church, you know, you get the cardinals together, they're just like Congress. They're trying to get their little piece of, you know, power. And power corrupts, you know, and that's what happens. So, it's interesting when you take that same perspective, you know, of miscommunication, misapplication, and misappropriation from Judaism 
and people teaching about what Jews are like, and then you tell a Jew that, you know, and you go, really? Where did you get this information? From a dead guy? <laughs> oh, a Christian respected dead guy. Josephus. You ever hear of Philo? <laughs> you ever hear of anybody else? <laughs> Have you ever read Tanya? <laughs> oh my God. You, do you know who Maimonides is? Mom, mom? No? Well, such a deal. And you're going to tell me about what you know, the Pharisees were doing and the Sadducees, because they were Sadducees. Really? Okay. It's kind of like the same way in marriage. You get two people, they don't know each other. They act like they know each other, and then they want to get to know each other. I mean, you know they want to get to know each other. You know, and they learn to live together for a while, but they aren't taught that it's a relationship of development. That marriage is a covenant of keeping two people together so they would develop that oneness with God and oneness with each other. It is what should be said when you go to church. You are getting married in the church. And I don't mean about, you know, your marriage vow that you made before all these witnesses. Although, if you really got into it, you'd realize that this is supposed to be a community you are committing yourself to, and everybody in that marriage, as they're watching you get married, are vowing to be witnesses and to be your counselor, to help you out in times of struggle, to help you out when you're falling down and you don't know what to do, or you committed adultery, or you sinned, or you've done something. That's what witnesses are for to testify for you on your behalf, to be a part of you. The families coming together and joining in this marriage. So marriage isn't about a man and a woman. It's about a man and a woman and a mother-in-law and a father-in-law. It's about community. Oh no, here comes that dirty word. Commune. You know, having a oneness. Oh no, he's going to try to sell everything and give it all to the poor. That Jesus talked about. Jesus was trying to say something here. Look, you know, this is big deal. If you're going to have a wife, you might not be able to be my minister. If you're going to have a wife, you might not be able to follow me. People always tell me, oh, well, you know, Jesus was a rabbi because at 30, you know, he was going to, you know, 30 was the ideal time to have a... a, a Jesus at 30 would be a rabbi because, guess what, at 30 years, that's when he was eligible to become a rabbi. Then why is he married? Because he wouldn't be a rabbi without getting married. Oh, we forgot about that part. Well, he's married to the church, so that counts. Twisted pretzels are kind of interesting, you know, because you don't call a pretzel stick, you know, a pretzel. You call a pretzel stick. And that's kind of what people try to tell me. This pretzel stick is really a pretzel, but you know what? It's not twisted, it's just straight. But it's not a pretzel stick, it's a pretzel. Right. If I had a big enough stick, I'd beat you with it. But I'll beat you with this pretzel stick, because guess what? Jesus was not a rabbi. Was not a rabbi. He was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. There is no place in scripture where it says, Jesus is a rabbi. People called him a rabbi because he was teaching, not because he was a rabbi. They would not have accepted him as a rabbi. First of all, let me make a match for you. Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Then we'll talk. Otherwise, what kind of rabbi are you? You're not good for anybody. You haven't been married. You don't know how to get along with somebody. So if you don't know how to get along, how can you teach anybody else anything in the ministry? Ooh. Ooh, ah, now that's an interesting concept, isn't it? Isn't that something what the New Testament did? A lot of times we have these perspectives of the Bible that are often taught as edicts from denominations, that are often taught as dogmas from doctrines that are invented to try to keep people safe from straying, to keep people from going off target, on the tangents. You know, kind of like we now have five points arguing with three points about two points and one point in order to get some points about what they think that they know because they don't know and they're going to argue about whether they're following five points, four points, three points, two points, or one point because they really aren't following either one of them and they don't have any point to argue about because the person who really was the one that was trying to deal with this in the first place, Calvin, you know, wouldn't have known what the heck they were talking about on any of the points. He didn't come up with those. The people did. After the fact. Isn't that kind of like what people are doing today with Jesus? After the fact, making up, you know, our distinctives, our directives, our quite a quote dogmas, our doctrines. I think so, because you know Jesus didn't say this is my doctrine and I want you to follow me. Because if you don't follow me, then you're not going to be my disciple. So if you don't know my doctrine or my dogma, then I don't know that you are really one of mine. 
No, Jesus said this, I say unto you. You've heard it said, but I say unto you. He's telling the people. He's telling them what you hear. He's trying to make you think, make you understand. And that's kind of what happens in fights. People aren't trying to hear. They're mad. They have mob mentality. They are angry and their emotions are involved rather than devotion to God. So a lot of what happens in arguments, debates, relationships, the breakdown of communication, the realization of not being that type of person that God wants you to be, is simply that. You have to have the reality of knowing that you may have some misconceptions, some misappropriation of knowledge, some misapplications involved in the realization of what is happening right before your eyes. Oh, well, you said, and she said, and he said. I can tell you quite frankly, you know, when I sit down and I have a conversation, <laughs> it, how do you say this without getting accused of ego? I know what people say to me. I've been made into, a long time ago with the gifts of the Spirit, um, a witness, a testament. I'm just a witness. I just... I, I've got really good retention. You tell me something, I know the words you use, and I know the way you phrase them, and I know what you said. And it's because the Spirit of God will bring that up because I'm used that way in order to, as a scribe, instructed in the kingdom of heaven and righteousness, that bring forth out of the treasure chest full of things, full of new. I understand how you say a word, and the way you say the word, and the usage of particular words, because we're told that. In the King James Version, now it's just King James, it's the only time they really use this word conversation. It says, let your conversation be arranged. Let your countenance have a certain appearance. And those words literally mean more than just simply talk. Sorry, they do. And countenance means more than simply the way you look. Sorry, it does. You can give someone a scowl, and that's their countenance, and that means a lot more than what you think it means in just looking like scowling. Hatred. So, in knowing that, God a long time ago gave me, when I went into ministry for the first time, you know, and stayed in it, because I liked it, um, an opportunity to fall flat on my face. And I used some teaching, you know, material that was wrong. It was wrong. I mean, it was like almost as bad as Mike Warnke claiming to be a witch. You know, I mean, it was that bad. And yet, I thought it was so good at the time because I just didn't spend the time to research it. It uh, wouldn't have been something most people would say directly affects your salvation, but everything that you do that goes off track literally affects your salvation in some way. So, I went off track and I got busted. I got hugely busted because Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, taught me wrong. We got serious. This was Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And it was just a minor thing to you and a little thing maybe to someone else, but to a Jewish person, hey, it was a lie. And it was something I didn't appreciate. And it was something I was taught by a pastor. And I really am upset always and have been, and I finally confronted him. And nowadays they don't teach. They teach really the way that it's supposed to be. But... I was told this in the Jesus movement, and it was the one time that I said, you know what, from now on, I don't trust anybody. I will remember and I will retain everything that's said to me because I don't ever want to be caught into this absolute humiliation before the ungodly, which at that time I was dealing with anti-Messianic Jews, you know, that were, in, in other words, I was dealing with Jews for Jesus and I was being confronted by what we call anti-missionaries that come out and purposely try to tear down, break down, and humiliate or somehow bring up some kind of false accusation against you. They come at you. They're Judaizers. Literally. And they're still out there. As a matter of fact, most of what Christendom does in supporting Israel is being used by Judaizers in order to deceive. And they're deceiving you because they're telling you, yeah, give us your money. And by the way, you cannot witness to Jews. Give us your money. And by the way, you've got to sign this paper that says you will not proselytize a Jew. Give us your money. I don't support the state of Israel. I support those that are serving the state of Israel in the land doing what God tells them to do. I don't universally support anybody. I'm sorry, that's a false teaching. It is right, I don't want to say from the pit of hell, but you know what? Satan's laughing from the pit of hell about that one. Ah, we're going to give you support no matter what. Go kill in the name of God. Yay. 
and you support that. Really? Wow. Unadulterated Israel. Go bomb the snot out of someone. You can kill because your God's chosen people. Never mind what Jesus said. Never mind that if you die today, you're going to hell, Jew, unless you know Jesus. Oh, we don't want to, you know, like, touch God's anointed. Huh. Yeah, no kidding. Because you just put the Jewish blood on your hands, and you are accountable for that. Because you won't tell them about Jesus? Ezekiel will rise up and witness and testify to you, or Elijah, anyways, and so will Moses, about what you did by saying, oh, we don't want to touch the anointed. We don't want to witness to them. God forbid that we would tell a Jew about Jesus. Instead, we would rather they hopefully survive until that day when they will accept Messiah. But in the meantime, go to hell. Be free. See what happens with miscommunication of ideas? Well, whoever touches you, touches the apple of my eye. Uh, who was he saying that to? Be very careful. Judah at one time rebelled against God. Israel at one time rebelled against God. At the time, the prophets were sent to them and told them, Look, I'm not listening to you. Hello? Let's be real. God hasn't changed neither Jew nor Gentile, barbarian, Scythian, nor free, male or female, but all as one before the foundation of the world that God has said, you must know the Lord Jesus Christ or you will go to hell. Because every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And it's not about Gentiles standing back and watching Jews die needlessly or supporting the state of Israel. We think we should. Huh. Even Chuck Smith said, look, I agree with them, you know, I'll send them money, but you know, when they're doing something wrong, I have to send money for that. I'll go plant trees, you know, or I'll go, you know, build up the baptismal where, you know, John the Baptist was, or I'll, you know, donate money to, you know, the orphans or the widows or those people that are in Israel or, you know, different things. But do you think he unadulterated, went and supported the, the mechanization of the armies of Israel when they were attacking, do you remember when Israel bombed America, sank our battleship? You don't? Oh, you don't. Wow, interesting. When we got a, when Israel got away with uh, the destroyer, the frigate that was sitting off the coast of Israel, spying on Israel next to the Egyptian freighter, and by the way, Israel said, "Oh, oops, sorry, we were after the Egyptian. We thank you. <laughs> no more battleship." Really? You never heard of that? I wonder why. Chalk it up to what we call misinformation. So, truth in and of itself is what we seek. My wife, when I, she fights with me, doesn't want the truth. She wants her feelings to go with where she wants to go with them. Mad, 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 mad. Until she's ready to get over it, she's mad. And a lot of people are the same way about their Bible. They want to do what they want to do when they want to do it. They don't want to know the truth. Because if they did, they would come to the truth of Jesus and be exposed to the light to reveal what kind of person they are. Sinner, like you and me. And they would accept that kind of examination to say, yeah, I did it. I blew it. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you that I can go forward. And yeah, thank you, Lord, by the way. God, thank you for that fight today. Man, I was blessed. It was great, man. She got a whole bunch of stuff off her chest. She got a chance to sit there and tell me how much she loved me. She got a chance to, like, you know, share with me. I got a chance to relate to her on a different level. I got a chance to express some things to her. God, it was cool. Thank you for that fight. It was wonderful. I'm amazed by how you do things. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. She is maturing in such a way it's not like the way we used to be. <laughs> Thank God, you know. Give me a lot of gray hairs over the years. Because <laughs> we who are spiritual ought to bear the burden of those who are yet carnal, that they may be brought up into the fullness of the likeness of the Son of God, the Son of Man who died for us and gave himself for us. We ought to bear their burden. We. Me. My one. So, I'm often fascinated because, you know, people don't like to talk about those things. Ah, you know, well, you know, yeah, we're having problems. Well, we'll pray for you. We'll pray for you, but don't tell me about it. Pray for them. Stick a thumb in it. 
like Romaine used to say. You know, I mean, that's how fights go. You can't fight when you got a thumb in it. And you know, yuck. I used to tell my wife that she can't stick her thumb in it, man. She's right. She'd have bought. If my wife, at any point in time when we're fighting, ever stuck her thumb in her mouth, she'd bite it off. And she'd chew on it. <laughs> Trust me. So what I do, I choose to use Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts. No. <laughs> I love the fight today. It's why I'm mentioning this and why I'm doing this particular tape is um, I love this book. Bill Gothard Ministries has, you know, an institute of basic youth conflicts and they really have an outline that's good. I mean, I don't go by just one person's, you know, opinion. But they have a very good outline that technically is used for basic youth conflicts. Sadly, our society, I don't see any youth needing that conflict seminar. I see men and women needing that youth conflict seminar. And so I teach it. I teach basic youth conflict seminar to everybody on video. And it's fun to do because you get to go through all the different aspects of relationship that we don't practice, but that is written in the Word of God. We don't employ, and yet we go to these massive, expensive seminars. We try to tell everyone, Ah, we're going on the Christian cruise. Hey, you want to have a 24-hour weekend? Let's go snatch away some time, you know. Hey, let's go have a marriage seminar. You know, the marriage seminars were good when they did them, the Close Encounter Catholic things, you know, that they did. And, you know, that began a whole backlash of evangelicals saying, Well, we don't want to do it with the Catholics. We want to do it on our own. You know, marriage encounter, now we want to have our own Christian cruise. You know, we want to Christianize it because we don't want it to be a Catholic thing. You learn from everyone. Everyone has a piece of the puzzle. The reality of the fact of God using Catholics is the fact that we come from that same limb. We are part of the Catholic Church, whether you like it or not. We are part of the Protestant Church, whether you like it or not. I don't care whether you were raised in church or not. That is your heritage. That is your birthright. That is part of who you are in Christendom. You are a Judeo... Ooh... Christian. That means you are Catholic, Protestant, Lutheran, Methodist, Evangelical. You know, I mean, work your way down the tree, you know, not on the limb. And quite frankly, you know, I'll be honest with you. Most of the people that have no real, you know, like, appearance of, you know, some kind of, like, stock <laughs> are way out on a limb. So every time that you think you've seen something that's, like, so right on, it's probably way out on the limb. Don't be surprised if when the wind blows, that limb breaks. And yet, as you get closer to the stalk, closer to the branch, inward towards you know the, the trunk, you get more of the precise, concise knowledge these men and women of God from Christendom, from Christianity, whether it be like, oh, I don't know, um, well, they're early church fathers, to put it bluntly. They were accurate and they were able to bear the brunt force of all these branches that are out there. It's kind of like, right now I can tell you that evangelical Christianity is going to break off a branch. A huge branch. A huge branch of evangelical Christianity is going to fall off the tree of Christendom. The militant part. The part that says it's okay to kill. The part that says it's okay because God has given us the right to take drones and to kill innocent men, women, and children while we're trying to get our main target. Oh, collateral damage is okay. We are Christianizing our military now to the point where we're saying, hey, never mind the PTSD. Never mind you got blood on your hands. Never mind the fact that you have taken an innocent life. Can you ever be in a priesthood again? But you could be a king. Hey, hey, all right. High five it, dude. Give me a gun so I can go be a king. Gentile. Because i got news for you. That's not what Jesus taught at all. It never was and never has been the fortitude or the plan of God to kill in the name of God. That's why the big branch of American, political, evangelical, violent means justifies the end 
radical Christianity is going to be broke off. Soon. God will just... Poof, and they're going to go off onto a tangent. And nobody's going to follow them. Except, you know, patriots. You know, the super uber-patriotism? The same kind that made Germany into Nazism? That's what uber-patriotism does. It makes Stalin successful in Russia. It makes Hitler successful in Nazism. It made... I was trying to think in Israel. Um, there was a Jewish terrorist here in America. I can't think of his name right now. It made him successful because he would go out and kill people. You know, he would go find you know people that were attacking Jews, or he'd go out and find people that were going to do it. And his organization would kill them. You know, like white supremacists. It was back in the 60s and 70s. I can't remember his name. It was a pretty famous person too. You know, he would use every means possible to destroy that person's life, and then behind the scenes, you know, kill him. And he finally got busted, you know, and whatever. But, you know, it's it's not uncommon. Uber-patriotism is what we call it. That is also, by another word, one interesting word that we use in the Bible. It comes from the Bible, it's used in the Bible, and it explains a lot about where they're coming from. It's called zealots. We call them true believers in some ways, in psychology, and we call them something else in, you know, like, well, you know, different venues. But basically, in biblical teaching and in biblical theology, a zealot and the zealots are the ones that eventually caused the destruction of the temple to be fulfilled that Jesus said would happen. That those people who thought by political means to usher into the kingdom of God, even like today they say they want to repair the world, they want to prepare for the kingdom age, they want to bring about the kingdom by their excuse me, lifestyle and bring in and usher in the kingdom age zealous. They're off. They're wrong. They're so zealed and have such zeal that they lack the knowledge thereof of what Jesus said. And they reject any notion that Jesus himself would not follow them when they want to make him their central core without him being and having a voice to tell them what to do. Because that's what zeal does. Zeal will take the mass mob and say, as you've heard today, very clearly, we the people, we have rights. It is our right to protest. We are protesting. Kind of sounds like Protestant, doesn't it? We are so adamant that we have to take a stand for righteousness sake. We have to do what we want done or this nation will go to hell in a handbasket. If we don't stand up, who will? If we don't make our stand, if we don't fight for what is right, then evil will succeed. Really? Really? Is that what happened in, you know, like, you know, 0 A.D., B.C., you know, like when Jesus was around? Was evil, like, you know, so successful that, you know, God didn't accomplish things? I kind of think of, like, Pontius Pilate, you know, when, you know, they're having this conversation, and Jesus says, hey, you know what, you ain't got no power, dude. You know, yeah. <laughs> what do you think you are? Man, my father gave you authority. My father. It's kind of like when people tell me they hate President Obama. Dude, God gave him power. Just like Pontius Pilate. You think Pontius Pilate and uh, President Obama are any different? Really? Yeah, because Pontius Pilate, you know, didn't go to church, and quite frankly, President Obama goes to church. Nominally, but he goes to church. He's being ministered to. You know, praise the Lord. We pray for him. And so, being in that position, God put him there. And Jesus said, you'd have no power except my Father put you there. You know? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not America. My kingdom is not of this world. But if it were, then God, I could call down the angels from heaven and God would send my followers to fight for me. If Jesus didn't call it down then, why are you acting like he's doing it now? And you're killing those whom he died for. I don't understand that at all. You know, I've never understood this. But when people and Christians are trying to tell me, you know, I mean, it was funny because I was looking at a Pastor Chuck... Uh, uh, Pastor Chuck had a, recently passed away and went to go home to be with heaven. Go and home to be in heaven. And um, a military, God bless him, Semper Fi, Semper Fidelis, um, but uh, a pastor, Pancho, 
um, that was getting a question said, you know, well, in light of all these things that are going on in the military, and that being not, of course, a Christian organization, and, well, we think it's Christian, but, you know, we're under orders, but never mind about that. But in light of being in this military organization, uh, what do you think we ought to do being in the military? And Pancho said, you signed up your own. You volunteered. You gave it to the government. You're owned by the government. And that was it. He walked off stage. I went, yeah, you did it, dude. Hey, you're a slave. That's what military is. You are vowing to give your life, not for Jesus. Let's be real. You're not there to serve Jesus. God did not send you to the military. God sent you to be a missionary. I'm sorry. He didn't send you out to kill. He sent you out to save. You got it backwards, dude. But once you've signed on the dotted line, guess what you've done? You've given away all your rights. I thought when we got saved, we gave our life over to Jesus. So we don't have any rights and privileges as a zealot. Our life is given as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. I have no right to give my life over to anyone else or anything else except Jesus Christ. It's my reasonable service as a living sacrifice. The Bible says so. Am I serving the pastor? Am I serving the church? Am I serving anyone else or anything else except for the Lord Jesus Christ? Pardon me, expression, you know, can I say something right now? Because, you know, it's kind of like... I'm a little excitable after, you know, fighting with my wife today. Hell no! I have no right, I have no privilege to be able to make that choice with my eternal destiny hanging in the balance. I have the privilege to go and do what I want to do. Hey, yeah, you know what, I think I'll just sign away my life for the next four years. Dude, you're owned. Own it. Be the best military you can, I guess. Between you and the Lord. Now go for it. But guess what? God ain't kicking you out. Although he tried with me. <laughs> Long story there. That was a big one. And God isn't going to honor you and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You killed 70,000 of my enemies. You know, never mind if they could have been saved. But you know, ah, forget about that. They were collateral damage. Ah, you were just following through with what you were told to do. You know, I didn't want them saved anyways. It isn't God's will that all men should perish or that God so loved the world. No, rather, we, we get to pick and choose who we get to use, you know, and who we get to lose because after all, we're not trying to save those that are in Islam and we sure don't want the, you know, Mormons to get saved and we don't want some of these other guys to get saved and God knows it's too hard to witness to a Jew so we don't even want them to get saved. We just want, you know, our people to be saved. we got to save the nation. After all, if we don't protect the nation with our military, who will? As the mountains all around Jerusalem. You know, you kind of wonder. Did you guys ever read the Bible? It's not by mind. It's not by power. It's not by spirit. But by my spirit, said the Lord. If you're looking to Egypt and the chariots for strength and for deliverance, the prophet told Israel, I don't think it's going to work. I think that you've got a problem. If you don't get the with the God, the get the what the. You're not going to get the saved. But hey, you tell you what you're going to do. If you follow the Lord your God, when they come outside the wall, they're going to hear a little word in their ear and they're going to turn around and you won't have to fight a battle. They'll run back and they'll get destroyed by some other guy that's out there going to wipe them out. Did you ever read the Bible? Really? Did you? So you got to save America? you got to save the world by killing someone? Okay. Is that anything like bombing Iran? You know, how long we've been saying that, you know, they're going to make the bomb, you know, so we got to bomb Iran and Israel's going to bomb Iran. Like, almost 10 years ago now? Do you realize how long we've been saying Israel's going to bomb Iran? I mean, not Iran, Iraq. <laughs> you realize how many times every year people keep going, it's going to happen. Man, the Lord's return is going to happen before they bomb Israel or Iraq. They'll probably get two or three reactors by the time people get around it supposedly fulfilling what all oh, they're going to do it. Yeah, because God's not in control. And nobody you know, is going to pray for the salvation of those. We want them bombed instead. Let's nuke them.
if you don't read books like this Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts Research in Principles of Life if you don't find quality tools to study the scriptures if you don't amalgamate much of the wisdom of what God has taught throughout the centuries and you can look and find right there in your Bible and yet you can't be led astray but you will be because you will listen to someone and they'll tell you to go off on serving the military you know or somehow go off and you know doing something else that doesn't lead to the kingdom of heaven but rather leads to your self-destruction and oh yeah by the way we do salute all those who have died for their country never mind they went to hell because they weren't saved but we salute those who died for the country I don't I say how dare you leave your wife behind and your children how dare you take into consideration those people you've left behind without salvation and that they could wind up risking eternal damnation like you did without you doing something about it because you had the opportunity to get saved and you didn't and so now you died for your country I don't see that as a hero I see that as a fool in his folly and quite frankly there's a great majority of people that aren't saved that are dying for their country every day now God bless those that are saved I'm thrilled that you did I'm happy that you will I'm glad I hope you'll receive a reward for what you did in some way I wish you would have saved some people that day and I hope you did maybe maybe your buddy that you know you died for or something I don't know you know God can use that God has used to be Campus Crusade for Christ was inside of the military inside the Marine Corps even in boot camp itself MCRD and we do have Calvary chapels that are very adamant about pushing and we have a chaplaincy right now inside of the military that goes to military men and I have no idea what they teach now I don't really care because I'm not so sure that all Calvary chapels are really talking the same story either I know a lot of them don't believe in the same thing I do you know that well well you know shoot first question later Okay. I think there was a woman, you know, like down in Florida that got, you know, kidnapped and, you know, their guy killed a bunch of people, you know, guards and everybody else trying to take him down. And she kind of did a different way. You know, she kind of said, you know, there's purpose for your life, you know, maybe you should turn yourself in, you know. And she spent the time, risked her life, you know, could have been destroyed, wiped out, annihilated. Funny how God did that. He used the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and yet, wow. She was a hero and they tried to tell her story. She tried to kind of stay away from it. She says, oh, look, I'm, I still got issues. I still got problems. Yeah, I'm still dealing with it. I don't understand all this yet. You know, I'm still kind of going with it. But at the time, you know, it's what God told me to say, you know. So, what I would say to you as you think that you know so much, if any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing at all. I would say to you, look, be very careful about words you're using, like, you know, Pharisees or whatever. Do your homework. Do your research. Study to show thyself approved, the workman that need not be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Because your wife, if you're fighting with her, might have a point, if you're not seeing it from her perspective. You, O oh man, if you are a woman, or if you're fighting with your husband, and you're not kind of like, you know, seeing it from his point of view, Maybe you should ask for a third party investigation there. You know, Jesus there too. Because Jesus is in the midst of your argument. Now, it doesn't have to be a fight that leads to a divorce. It doesn't have to be a situation where you fight until the day that you separate or you divide up your assets, you know, and you think that somehow you're not going to carry baggage or luggage the rest of your life. You can be forgiven divorce. Divorce is not like the unpardonable sin. Matter of fact, I think the unpardonable sin, well, unpardonable sin, forget about that part. I think divorce is no different than somebody walking out of one church and going to another. Because frankly, you should be staying in the church you're in. I don't care where you're at. Stay there. Help them grow. You'll grow as you help them grow, and they'll grow as you help them, as you as you grow, they'll grow. As you are grown, they will grow. And God will grow you up as trees of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. But if you're constantly, and I, you know, I'm the guy that does move around according to as the spirit moves. You know, when the wind blows, Michael goes. You know, and so God moves me around a lot. But if you don't have that kind of ministry as a missionary, then where God puts you, God sets you in order, in place. Stay there. Function. Don't divorce yourself from the church. It's no different than divorcing yourself from your wife. 
Both are forgivable. Now you treat leaving the church as something minor. I don't. Neither does God. Don't divorce yourself from your brother because he's like, you know, oh, well, he went gay. So you don't love him anymore? Well, I love him, but you know, I hate the sin, so I don't love him. Really? Figure that one out again. You may want to work on that one. I don't think you get the picture here of Jesus dying for him, too. Oh, well, you know, that, that you know, I just, I, you know, I don't want to do that. Yeah, no. Divorce is divorce. And you use that word only for some reason about marriage when it applies to every single relationship in life. And the most wonderful thing that you're going to learn about divorce is one day you're going to divorce yourself from this body of flesh you live in and you're going to go into heaven. We call that death. But it's divorcing yourself from this world and what's happening in the world. Now, it is interesting, Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He that loves the world and the things of the world cannot be my disciple. He that is of the world and has many things of the world cannot follow me. It's interesting that we do not divorce ourselves from those things that entangle us. We want to be married to the world. We want to be married to our debts. We want to be married to our responsibilities because it makes us a man of integrity. Or does it? Or are we foolishly getting ourselves caught up in the world's net and we don't know what we're doing? Watch and be ready, for you know not when the Son of Man will return. Watch and be aware, for you don't know that you might entertain angels unaware. Watch and look very closely at the person you're talking to, because that person has Jesus inside. So the one you're mad at, the one you're having a fight with, the one that you're arguing to, is Jesus, through and through. Because you may be mad at your wife, but that means you're also mad at the person inside her. And that person is Jesus. And a woman, if you were doing like passive aggression and using all the little sneaky techniques, that, you know, we, we, we have ways of doing that, don't we? Man, you don't get any. You're in the doghouse. You know, well, that's not one of the ways. But, you know, that's what people usually use in order to make a point. But, you know, those subtle things. I'm not making him breakfast. You know, I'm not cooking for him anymore. You know, I'm not picking up after him. I'm tired of that. You know, let him do it for a while. You know, watch this. I'm not going to answer, the, you know, the door when it rings. I'm not going to, you know, like, go take care of the kids, you know. And watch him see that. You know, he's going to get the message sooner or later. Well, no, he isn't. You will get the message real soon. Because God is at work in you, both into will of his good pleasure, but he's at work in your husband, both to do and to will of his good pleasure. And together, your relationship together is a demonstration of Jesus and the church. And if Jesus had something to say to the letters in the seven churches, the seven different types that there are in heaven and on earth now, then he's got something to say to you. O oh man, O oh woman, you pick which church you are, woman, and you pick which Jesus you are, O oh man, and you figure out for yourself whether you meet that criteria. Because guess what? Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered, O oh thou man. So if you can't stand up to your woman or your wife and be that type of person that Jesus is and still accountable and responsible and still have an integrity between doing what God says and hearing the voice of your wife. I got news for you. Abraham had the same problem. Hey, you know what? You want to be Abraham? Fine. Go listen to Sarah. And go screw around with Hagar. Because you're going to have a bunch of Hagars in your life all over the place if you're in ministry and you're listening to what your wife has to say. I don't care if you're a pastor's wife telling the pastor, and I don't care if you're the pastor listening to your wife. Quite frankly, both of you, listen to Jesus. Whatever Jesus tells you, and if you can agree on that, hey, you've got it licked. But if Jesus didn't tell you, pastor, what you're doing, and if Jesus didn't tell you, pastor's wife, what you're doing, don't do it. Because you're deceiving yourself and you're ruining people's lives all around you. It's a deception. And it's the ultimate ego and pride. Just saying. So relationships are really what this was all about. Our relationship to each other that must be the foundation of what we see in our relationship to salvation because we cannot save ourselves and we are not allowed to go about our own business doing our own thing when we want to. 
Our relationship extends beyond the boundaries of what we can see, what we can touch, what we can feel, because Jesus is in us. And as the light of the world has gone out into the wilderness and the darkness, and it is shining brightly as set upon a hill, that it should be such that all men are drawn unto you, what manner of man ought you to be? What manner of woman? If people are looking at you because Jesus is in you, then you've got to let Jesus out and act like it. You've got to let Jesus be in control of your life. You've got to make Jesus Lord of your life. Man, woman, pastor, elder, deacon, pastor's wife, children, whatever. If Jesus isn't Lord, then He's not your Savior. But if Jesus is Lord of all, He's Savior of all. Because you don't get a little bit of Jesus and think that's it. As a matter of fact, Jesus is jealous over you so much so that He died for you. And God pours out His Spirit so much so that He's going to convict you. He's going to arrange circumstances to compress you. He's going to squeeze you until, until you cry out to Him. God, please forgive me. Please help me. Whatever. I don't know what's going on, man. I need help. You don't go look into somebody else. You go to God. God will help you. God will be your strong tower. God will be your deliverance. God will say, okay, <laughs> that's all I wanted. I just wanted you to ask me. That's all I wanted. All along, ask. And you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. It is all about relationship. Now, I'll admit, if you could get down, good luck with that one. Marriage, which you can't, and you never will. You think you do, but guess what? Uh, you know, Give me five minutes with a husband and a wife, and you know what? See right through the phonies. It doesn't take very long. One or the other is going to open your mouth and reveal a whole lot more than what either one of them wants known. And every counselor knows that. And everybody that studied the scripture that knows that scripture that says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. They know exactly where someone's coming from. Because people tell you. It doesn't take a word of knowledge. I got word of knowledge but, and word of wisdom. But you don't need the gifts of the Spirit in order to know that. Practically speaking, rabbis know this because they just listen to what people say. They try to get you talking so that you can give away so much information. Now, I'll admit the same thing is true about interrogation, and there's a certain amount of psychology and psychosis that goes on within you know sociology that people look at body language and other things that reveal things. But also, there's a perspective of the words themselves and how they're used that gives away everything of what's going on in your soul. And little did you know that the eyes also are the portals to your soul and your real. If you got the gift, so much more by just looking at a person's eyes. It's why, Allah, there's been a few times I just don't want to look at you. I mean, some people, I just don't want to look. I, you know, I see the pain. I see, I look at them and I... I even see sometimes the experience, you know, what they went through. And I was like, I, I don't want to see that. I, you know, it hurts. Because they, they haven't released it to the Lord. They haven't let go. They haven't given to God. They haven't, like, received God's... God's well, first they haven't forgiven a person, but they haven't received God's healing for that because their their bitterness has entrapped that with which God is trying to get them to let go of their fingers that are clinging to that wanting to relive it in some way in some masochistic you know narcissistic way that they don't know how to let go and let God heal them today so they just crawl into it and they just delve into it and they dig into it and they just get great enjoyment out of being miserable ooh I don't like to look at that and so Relationships is what it's all about. So if you get your life together and your wife, <laughs> notice I work that alliteration there. Wife, life, life, wife. Are you your brother's keeper? You better believe it. Matter of fact, ministry says your brother's keeper and you in the ministry are more responsible to those outside your home than you are for those in your home. Oh, wait a minute. Paul said this. Paul said, uh uh. Jesus said, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, no man that loveth his mother, his father, his brother, his sister, his wife, more than me, is worthy to be my disciple. If you love me, keep my commandments. Why don't you do the things I said? Put those three together and see how it works out for you. O thou who loveth my family more than I love the ministry. The ministry, that is, if God has told you to do something. Because whatever God tells you to do, that's ministry. It's not about church. Church is just a building. Church is just a bunch of people you know, get together and they say, hey, let's throw our money together, let's buy this building, let's do this thing, you know, let's pretend like we're worshiping God in a little temple. You know, frankly, it's going to be burned. You know, it's like there will be no church in heaven. There will be no walls, 
No sound system, no guitars. I'm sorry, it's your voice. If you can't sing now, you need to start. If you haven't opened your voice to give praise and thanks and worship, you need to do it now. Yes, you, O oh thou out of key singer. Because if you don't, no one else will. But if you do, everyone else will. Because they don't want to hear you. They'll sing louder. Trust me, it works. I sing very loud. Sometimes off key. Sometimes on purpose. Sort of. But the relationship is that aspect of that intercommunication, the interlocution of two souls that are in harmony towards that designation of traveling in the same place at the same time towards an accomplishment of some reachable, destined aspect of a point of reference that they are both agreeing on reaching at some point in time in some way, shape, or form that they have relationship and related to each other to be in that type of environment with each other. Get that? Do you understand? Relationship to man, to woman, to child, to husband, to wife, to church, to home, to God is about destination. Relationship is not a dead word. It is a active present tense thing that's going on in a active participation participation of the interlocution of two souls, the interrelationship of two people that exist, breathe, move, and have a being. In that respect, then when you have these things going on, if somebody trips, do they just fall or does one person grab a hold of them and hold them up? The relationship is all defined and everything that you're ever going to find in the Bible itself and in these seminar books, believe it or not, and in so many other books about relationship, although I hate, re I don't like to read books about marriage, no offense, but frankly, you know, they start off on the wrong foot and they uh, wind up on the left foot, you know, by the time they get done. I'm not much on marriage books. Sorry, I'm not much on marriage seminars. I've gone to a few, I've listened to a few. I listen to a teacher and I say, well, because they always think Jesus out. They want to know what the man's about, you know, they want to know what the woman's about. I know what a man's about, he's a pervert. You know, the woman's just trying to put up with him until she can get back to Jesus, you know. Because she has to deal with this guy, you know, because this guy's supposed to be a representative of Jesus and he ain't. You know, he wants, the, he wants what he wants when he wants it. You know, he's going to act like, you know, king of the hill until he gets there. Sorry, I'm a man. What am I going to do, lie? <laughs> Hello? But the reality of what God intended really is in the Bible. And most Jewish culture in the Bible, not necessarily in rabbinic culture, but in some teachings, the Tanya, um, it's an interesting book. It's not scriptural. It's, it's really an interesting book. It's not um, like, what do we call it? Uh, the Tanya is a, it's a commentary. Hey, guys, you yeah, It's good enough to be, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of hard to change things into cultural settings that fit. The Tanya would be like having I guess it could be like a devotional Bible or a study Bible, in a way. It's a dissertation of an explanation that's why it's commentary of that with which exists within the Torah and in the Bible, but not the way that you think and not the way that you'd understand. And it's not Kabbalistic. I mean, the Zohar, which is what you usually think of for Kabbalah, was one man sitting down and writing, you know. And uh, the Tanya is, you know, it's kind of like an interesting, you know, similar, sort of, but not, you know, because one goes one way, one goes the other way, and it's kind of like, mm. and the Tanya actually talks about Messiah. So it's kind of, kind of interesting. You know, it's kind of like a, I think for Jews, you know, it's like, well, yeah, where are we going to go with this one? Well, we know what we believe in, but how do we explain this one? Well, that's a good question, Lord. But anyways, it's not, I, I don't recommend reading it. But anyways, Jews have a way of looking at marriage as different than men. Uh, are, yeah. It's different than what most people try to make. Oh, well, the Jews were so mean to the women, and the women were so mean to them. I don't see that many miserable women, you know, in Jewish culture. You know, I'm sorry. Money goes a long way. So I'm kidding. Joke, big joke, little joke, no joke. Okay, fine. But the point is this. There's a difference between a culture that has survived centuries of persecution and knows how to have a relationship with their wife 
as a, and their children, as opposed to a culture that's you know gradually wiping itself out and can't even get back to agreeing on the same principles of what exists inside of marriage. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Jews have homosexual rabbis, so you know it's not like they don't know, and it's like not like every perversion hasn't been tried by some Jew somewhere. You know, and usually most Jews are the ones that have led perversion to start with. You know, they started it all. You know, no offense. You know, I'm not going to claim shame on everybody that's Jewish, but I'm not going to claim only the fame of everything that Jews do is right. No, some of the biggest crooks in the world were Jewish. But yeah, I know, Lord. I was thinking. Yeah, Jews are Jews are Jews, you know, and it's like, yeah, I know, I don't want to tell them that. And most Jewish people will operate not according to following Jesus, but according to following what's best for the Jew. Sorry to say that, but it's true. So your brother that may be a Jew, be careful. When it comes to the rubber meets the road, they may not follow Jesus as close as you think, or they might. They may not be operating according to the Spirit of God, but they may be operating what's best for that Jewish person or the Jewish nation, because... Klal Israel literally means that a Jew will operate for the benefit of the Jew, first himself, then to the Jew, then to the Gentile, or the other part, or the other person, or the other way. And I, I don't like to say it that way, but it's true. And that's kind of why Moses and Elijah are coming back. Because the law and the prophets are going to testify against the Jew, against Israel, against those whom you're saying, oh, let's bless them. That's not what God's going to do. <laughs> uh uh. And then the 144,000, yeah, you know, they're the ones that are going to go out because God's just going to say, save. I wouldn't be surprised if they're Chabad, but, you know, I doubt it. It could be, you know, I mean, they're not far, but not close. You know, it's like, how could you be so close and so far? But that's relationship. They don't have a personal relationship with God. God does not speak directly to people in Chabad. But, there's somebody talking to them in Hawaii, and it may not be such a good deal. Woo! You know? Woo! You know? The fathers are talking to me. Yeah, I can believe that one. Okay. Woo! Or the spirit of Messiah. Careful of that one. You know, the spirit of Moshiach that's gone out might not be such a good thing. You know? I mean, it's taught in Tanya, but it might not be the right spirit. Be careful. The direction determines the... the the result, well, it's not really that way either. The result determines the direction of the object with which is passing through that determination within the process of its delineation when it finally reads that reaches its destination. There we go. I can say that again, but I just don't want to. <laughs> I think. When you start thinking Jewish, you start going, woo, wow, woo, and you start combining all these recalcitrant thoughts with some cognitive... Um, interconnectivity on multiple levels of relationship of wisdom, knowledge, application, process, deviation, incorporation, realization, and acknowledgement. Because, well, it's ages, you know, I mean, they weren't stupid people. I mean, Jews aren't stupid. You know? I mean, come on now. You have a lot of people tell me and they teach the Bible as though, you know, the people wandering around were dumb fishermen or dumb, you know, like, ignorant, um, whatever, because they're under oppression. Uh, really? Okay. You know. Okay. You know, I'm not going to go there, but we'll see in the millennium. You go tell some of those people they're stupid. Uh, but the point being is this. Your relationship to what you're learning, your relationship to the Holy Spirit, your relationship to your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your wife, your church, your home, forget the country, it's not that important. Um, but those things are those with which God will use in order to compress you, confine you, define you, and bring you into a realization of the most important relationship you have to have in order for you to be a success in anything in life. One relationship with you and God. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, you will succeed at nothing. You think you succeeded. But woe to those who are rich now, who really shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. And there's a lot of Calvary people that are rich that think they're going to heaven. I think maybe they might go into tribulation period, you know. 
Maybe. I mean, that might be a good thing for them. They might be able to use their riches for some particular reason, you know. But, hey, there's some really rich people running around that are like, there's no way that I can define them any other way except calling them rich. Some, I might know, you know, sadly. But, who knows? Maybe, as some people say, oh, well, if you're doing God's will, he'll make you rich. Okay. Okay. Be careful. But that relationship that you have to have in these latter days is why we're taking so much time to spend on relationship. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, you'll be deceived. If you don't have a one-on-one -on -one with God alone and His Spirit with that Bible, and I don't mean reading it. I mean looking at it and saying, God, I don't get it. What is this saying to me? And then you can share it with others. Because I'll be honest with you, I don't teach anything I haven't proven is true. And I know it is. I know for a fact it is. I don't have to say, you know, this is this, and there, you know, the commentary say this, and I heard this, and I did this, and I had to go find someone else to teach me this. I had to. No, I quit that back when when I figured out they didn't know what they were talking about. As a matter of fact, it's kind of an interesting relationship I have with you know Calvary chapels and you know um, other churches and Judaism and Catholicism and even Mormons. You know, I've I've had Mormons in my life all my life. I grew up with them. You know, nobody ever tried to convert me. Nobody ever took me. Nobody ever, ever came up and said, "Hey, you know what? You got to be a Mormon." Matter of fact, most of them said, "God forbid." <laughs> I even worked for a bunch of Mormons. Yeah, no problem. We just got along great. They're no different than the Catholics, except the Catholic Charismatics knew Jesus. The Mormons don't. Sorry. Now, as far as religious zeal, hey, I love some of the Mormons. Now, some of them I think, you know, there's a lot of bitter men that really need a comeuppance, you know, in the Mormon doctrine because they're not doing what the Mormons are saying to do. And quite frankly, you know, some of those women that are in the Mormon church, they can be miserable, you know. Of course, if I had a bunch of kids too, I'd probably be miserable. But anyway, we'll go ahead. There. Jewish women have a bunch of kids too, but you know what? They're not miserable. You know, well, they don't have a bunch. They have some. But other cultures that have bunches of kids, they're not so miserable as what I see Mormon wives looking like. Man, they look sad. The barn needs painting, painted. That you know, was Walter McGee once said. But, uh, or J. Vernon McGee said. Not Walter McGee. J. Vernon McGee. But, you know, I mean, I'm not talking about makeup. I'm not talking about that. I think they just look oppressed, you know, depressed. And they're just hiding it. They're very, well, they're not doing such a good job anymore. Mormon church is going to change, and who knows, maybe they'll become saved, you know, soon. And they'll become what God uses. Who knows? That could happen. I say that about Chabad, too. You know, I say that about anybody. Catholic church, well, they're going, they're going to become something, but that's not what you think. But my point is this. If it so be that the Lord our God is real, is he? If it so be that Jesus has died for our sins and he did rise from the dead, did he? If it so be that the Bible is factual and that word of God is actual for the teaching of us by his spirit that makes it quickened and alive to us, does it? then we ought to give heed to these things that we are learning than to heeding fables and doctrines and traditions and those things that are leading us astray from our personal relationship with God our Father, with His Son Jesus Christ, with the leading of the Spirit of God in our life as He's teaching us His Word. If you're doing any other thing than those things, you are failing that ministry that God has given you for your family for your neighborhood, for your church, for your relationship, for every other person around you and about you and anyone that you're involved in. You have failed what Jesus said to do. Because at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, He said, don't go to Paul. He didn't say, don't go to Revelation. He didn't say, go to the rabbis. Although He did say, go to them and watch them. But, you know, other than that, you know, go there. You know, Present yourself if you got healed. But, you know, other than that, but you know the point. He said, You have heard it said, but I say unto you. And read it. I'm going to say, you know, it's almost to that point where, you know, we need to get off of the words in black 
and get on the words in red. Because I got a news for you. If you can't come to grips with the words in red, you'll never be able to deal with the words in black. Because frankly, a lot of what Paul said was specific to where he said it. Because if you can interpret the book of Acts and tell me that, you know, oh, we're not supposed to sell everything that we have. Jesus never said it. And we're not supposed to have all things in common because Jesus never did it. And the church never practiced it, you know, ever to any time since the book of Acts. And nobody does it in modern days. I would suggest to you, you better be in personal relationship and context with Jesus himself. Reading those words in red and dealing with them specifically. Because the words in black are being misused, abused, and confused all over Christendom. And unless you can look at the big picture, like some of us who have to minister to, you know, the Jews and the Gentiles and the men and the women, you know, and some of those that are way out on the land, some of those that don't even know that they're part of the tree, some of those that are hanging from the branches, some of those that have fallen off the branch, some of those that are in the roots. God knows I'm tired of it. I had to get into root theology for a long time. I don't want to be there, you know, because I had to deal with the early movement of the messianic movement and with, you know, although Jews for Jesus was fun, but, you know, chosen people and other things, you know. But, you know. And then go to Jerusalem. And deal with Calvary Jerusalem. Well, that was fun. <laughs> that was a unique experience. But unless you're gifted and enabled and supernaturally given certain wisdom and knowledge according to what God will teach you from books, from experiences in life that you are not necessarily making applicable only to yourself, but you're using that part of your life that you've gone through in order to reach out to others and you can make application to them by way of the word of God and you know that every detail of your life and every scripture is fulfilled and that everything can be arranged in a certain order that God has presented to people so that they can come to salvation in that and that you do hear his voice when you're talking and that you do hear his voice when you're speaking and that you're able to be dependent upon God in everything for all things as well as your health, wealth, prosperity, your doctrine, your teaching, your realization of knowing Jesus in any particular way then I would suggest to you, you better read the words in red. And you better get that right with God before you start getting into, Paul said, the church did this, they don't do this, Galatians says, Romans says, Philippians says. I'm not a Roman, and I'm not a Philippian. I live those words. I know what they mean. I use them every day. Pardon me. Romans, we can go the Roman road and I'll tell you everything that is in the book of Romans. We can go up through Galatia and start talking about what was going wrong and why and where and how they did it because of where they were and some of the people that were involved in it in relationship to whether they were with God or doing their own thing. Because Paul wrote to them. And in Ephesians, those things with which they were operating according to what they didn't know because they thought they knew and why Paul had to write to them. And the Philippians, by they were being so influenced by the confluence of so many multiple cultures dealing with certain realities that they had to adapt to within the context of their environment with which they were presented. And that with which in Titus and Timothy and Philemon and those places that God has arranged these things for us to see and consider. But I say unto you, Jesus said. So really... Whenever you start taking one part of the Bible, Genesis, well, that's a mess. But you know, I mean, if you really want to go in Old Testament and you don't put Jesus in it, you're not going to get it. But if you take anything that Paul, Peter, John wrote, you know, well, John's pretty good because he wrote, you know, whatever Jesus said, so I shouldn't say John, but First John, you know, kind of those things. And you don't go red on me, you know. If you can look at the words in black, you know, a red letter edition Bible, words in black, and you take one part of that out, and you start using that for your foundation, you're going to go off. Because if you don't compare that to the words in red, and you don't make that fit, and it doesn't fit, then you found the first thing that you're going to realize for the rest of your life that you'll be doing. What's the relationship between what Jesus said 
and what every other portion of Scripture is describing. Because, I'll be honest with you, your personal relationship will help you determine what Jesus said and how He applies it to your life. But you're not going to get that easily answered by asking your pastor. You're going to get a compromise of some type. Well, you know, I didn't mean it that way. Because I'll be honest with you, Jesus said is one of the most devastating reality checks for anyone in ministry to have to deal with. And they're either going to go the way of compromise or they're going to go the way of radical. And i got news for you. There's some people right now that have decided they gave up their churches to go radical on them. Because they're saying, hey, I just read what Jesus said and I can't explain it. Jesus is telling me to live it. Oh, Francis Chan. And Francis Chan did it. He said, I, I, can't, I can't reconcile this. I can't put together what I've been taught in this book, in this Word of God. Here I am looking at it. I've asked my fellow staff members, pastors, I said, look at this with me. What are we doing? What are we acting like? Are we willing to do this? This is what it says. Here it is in the Word of God. Are we really going to ignore this? Are we really going to pretend it doesn't exist? Are we going to somehow rationalize it to the times we live in? Or is this really the Word of God? Is it dangerous to change what God is saying? Is this the Word of God? Huh. I went, Yeah, dude. Oh. What are you going to do? What's your relationship to following Jesus? Or following man? Because the relationship that's going to save you in your church, the relationship that's going to save you in your denomination, the relationship that's going to save you in all of the things that you're doing today and bring you into eternity is one. One relationship. The one you have with Jesus. No other relationship is going to bring you to the realization of your Father in Heaven except Jesus Christ. And if He isn't speaking to you, you're missing the boat. You can go to counseling. You can get some nice words. You can get some nice theology. You can get some nice doctrine. They'll teach you a good way of religion. Matter of fact, you know, rabbis are really good at it. You know, what I mean, they can do a better job of teaching you religion than actually Christianity can. They got a very powerful, very unique way of bringing religion to a practical reality and live that way. It's kind of interesting. You know, it's kind of like it's very tempting, but it doesn't involve Jesus. Your pastor might involve Jesus to pray too, but don't expect from an answer. Or he may present that in some way that you know kind of deals with the issue, sort of, but you just didn't feel comfortable about it. So dare I say to you from James 1 5 and from Proverbs 3 5 and 6, be in relationship to your church. Be faithful to your relationship with your wife. Be confident of your relationship to your community, to your pastor, to those that you've submitted yourself to, even if you join the military for some stupid reason. Be faithful to that commitment. But maintain one thing in your life. Of all your relationships that you have to everything you have a relationship with, because all those are affected by the one thing in your life. The one God, the one way, the one truth, the one life. Maintain that relationship and find out all about Jesus. Because he said, My sheep hear my voice and they know me, and they will not follow the voice of another. And if my voice is the voice you're hearing, and I'm saying something contrary to what Jesus said, don't do it. But when Jesus speaks to you, oh my God, you go do it.